One of the oddest and most famous passages in the book of Ezekiel, found in chapter 37, which we're going to read today, has inspired many Sunday school lessons, sermons, and even a song. Um, And in this chapter, the prophet Ezekiel is led by God into a valley filled with bones, and then the Lord instructs Ezekiel to prophesy to the bones. And when he does, amazing things begin to happen. So let's read our story for today found in Ezekiel chapter 37. The Bible records, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. They were properly dead. He asked me, son of man, can these bones live? (laughs) I said, oh, sovereign Lord, you alone know. Good answer. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, (laughs) picture the scene, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together. (laughs) Suddenly there's a whole bunch of skeletons there. I mean, this is horror movie stuff. (laughs) This rattling sound, I can just hear this bone to bone. I looked and tendons and flesh appeared on them and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy son of man and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come forth from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy to them and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Oh, my people, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you, and you will live, and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and have done it, declares the Lord. Father, as we look at your word this morning, I pray that you'd give us wisdom and understanding and insight, that the words we hear would be yours alone, in Jesus' name, amen. So God takes Ezekiel to the middle of this valley where he sees this multitude of very dry bones. He asks Ezekiel if the bones can live, and he gives a very sensible answer. Now, Ezekiel had witnessed the Babylonians destroying Jerusalem. The northern kingdom had already been destroyed. He knew it was impossible to raise Israel from the dead, as impossible as it was to bring life to these very dry bones. So he answers the Lord (laughs) quite properly. Oh, sovereign Lord, (laughs) you alone know. (laughs) You know, this is not for me. 
this is something only you can do. See, in essence, only God can bring back what's dead, bring back to life. Then God has Ezekiel prophesy over the dry bones, commanding them to attach to one another. The skeletons come up, and then they get covered with the a, with a tendons joined together and skin and all the rest of it. But they just people there with absolutely no life in them. There's a form of what should be human. It looks like it's the real thing, but it's not. Then God has Ezekiel command breath into the hole, into those dead bodies, and they spring to life. They're standing on their feet. In fact, there's enough people there for an entire army. Interestingly, the word here for breath is the same word used in Genesis when God had formed Adam from the dust and breathed into him life. This vision has to be one of the most bizarre metaphors in all of Scripture. What do these bones symbolize? What's the historical context of the story? And why can it possibly matter for us now? I think before we discuss the vision itself, we have to understand everything that precedes chapter 37 and this portion that we've read, especially chapter 36. Because in the previous chapter, Ezekiel proclaims specifically the restoration of the nation of Israel. He specifically tells them that even though the nation is barren, one day there will be trees producing fruit. One day the economy of this now divided, broken, desolate nation will one day again flourish. Chapter 36 tells us that they will inhabit their towns, that their ruins will be rebuilt. He makes it clear, though, that God's going to do that, and he's going to do it for his own glory. In chapter 36, verse 22, he says, Therefore say to the house of Israel, this is what the sovereign Lord says. It is not for your sake, O Israel, that I'm going to do these things, but for the sake of my holy name, uh, which you have profaned among the nations where you have gone. Verse 24, for I will take you out of those nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. It was impossible. The country was in ruins. And yet, God says it's going to happen. They were under the foot of the powerful Babylonians. They could see no possible renewal of the Israelite nation. In essence, they were like dry bones, a dead nation, full of absolutely no sign of recovery whatsoever. Would it take a miracle? Absolutely. Was it possible? Only you know according to Ezekiel's answer. Now, scholars tell us that this whole prophecy has a dual meaning. Firstly, the impossible restoration and life to a lifeless dead country, but also, secondly, the resurrection of the dead to eternal life, spiritually and physically. In fact, the early church fathers, they were so clouded by the fact that Israel could never come together and become anything, that they focused entirely upon the resurrection of the dead, the final resurrection. But let's start with the first of this dual prophecy. Let's talk with Israel, this valley of very dry bones, this almost non-existent nation under the yoke of foreign invaders at the time of Ezekiel's prophecy. I want to give you a brief history of Israel. What is it? Where does it come from? Why is it even important? If you don't like history, I'll wake you up as soon as I'm finished. <laughs> In Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, the Lord had said to Abram, God identified this man, Abram, not because he was good looking, not because he was wealthy, not because he was extremely smart. Not because he was poor or marginalized, 
not because of any reason at all other than God selected Abraham because God chose this man, Abraham. And he says to him, leave your country, your people and your father's household and go to the land I will show you. He simply calls him. Now God's got something in mind. God's intention ultimately is through Abraham who will in, in, inherit a land which will become known as Israel. He would declare to the nations of the earth who he was. That was God's initial intention for the people that he, was, he chose and initially Abram. His intention was not to elevate the Jewish people. It was not to make a people for himself just so that they were special and everybody wasn't. The intention was that they would reveal to the entire earth how good God actually is and what God requires of them. So Abram sets out to the land of Canaan with his wife Sarah and his lot his lot his nephew lot and a whole bunch of people and animals and then in verse 7 we read the lord appeared to abram and said to your offspring i will give this land that they were now in and he built an altar there to the lord who had appeared to him then some stuff happened between lot and him and it gets resolved and then we read again in genesis 13 the lord said to abram after lot had parted lift up your eyes from where you are Look north, look south, look east and west, and all the land that you see, I will give to you and your offspring for how long? Forever. Forever. Not for any limited time. Not for any prescription of the United Nations in 2022. But he said for ever verse 16 i will make your offspring like the dust of the earth so that if anyone could count the dust then your offspring could be counted go walk through the length and breadth of the land for i am giving it to you this is confirmed again and again but i'm talking now specifically through jacob whose name was changed by god to israel in genesis 28 the Lord appears to Jacob. He says, I'm the Lord, the God of your father, Abram, the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. This is at the time of his dream. In verse 14, your descendants will be like the dust of the earth. You will spread out to the east and west, to the north and the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. How much more could we be blessed than in the Lord Jesus Christ. How much more? Verse 15, I'm with you, will watch over you whenever you go. I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I've promised you. Numbers 34 details the exact boundaries, the land of God's people. But now for these nomadic shepherds, having a permanent home to call their own was a dream come true. It was a place of rest. It was going to become a land of milk and honey. Let's run forward now a few years. We read of Israel's first king, King Saul. Then came King David. And then King Solomon, who built the first temple. Around 930 before Christ, following the death of Solomon, the kingdom split into the southern kingdom of Judah, which had Jerusalem in as its capital, the northern kingdom of Israel, which had Samaria as its capital. So suddenly Israel, this united land of God, a thousand years before Jesus, 3,000 years ago, in other words, is already fragmented. In 720, the Assyrians captured Samaria, the capital of the northern kingdom, and carted off many of the people. The rest basically fled down south. In 536, the Babylonians came and flattened Judah, taking Jerusalem, destroying Solomon's temple, carrying off the temple treasures, and many of the useful people, or the people they deemed useful, took them off to Babylonia. 
Sometime after that, King Cyrus allowed 50,000 Judeans led by Zerubbabel, and we'll get to that story, to return to Judah and rebuild the temple, completed about 516. Then a second group of 5,000 led by Ezra and Nehemiah returned to Judah in 456. All just history. I'm just painting the picture of this nation in fragments. Then for the next several centuries, the land of modern-day Israel was conquered and ruled by various groups, including the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Arabs, the Fatimids, the Turks, the Crusaders, the Egyptians, the Mamelukes, the Islamists, and some others in between. From 1517 to 1917, what is today Israel, along with much of the Middle East, was ruled by the Ottoman Empire, also Muslims. At one stage, they even had a tree tax for those living in Israel. So if you had a tree, you had to pay tax on it. People couldn't afford the tax, so they chopped down all the trees. So desolate was Israel by this stage, a desert. No mention of fruit trees, no mention of an economy, no sign of any life. It is a valley of desperately very dry bones. In 1917, at the height of the war, First World War, the British Foreign Secretary at that time, his name was Arthur James Balfour, submitted a letter of intent to support an, a Jewish uh, homeland in Palestine. When World War I ended in 1918 with the Allied victory, the 400-year Ottoman Empire rule ended and Great Britain took over what became known as Palestine or modern-day Israel. The British controlled Palestine in the years following, uh, the British, I beg your pardon, controlled Palestine from 1918 until Israel became an independent state in some of your lifetimes on the 6th of May, 1948. Then miracle followed miracle. All the, little, all the wars, I mean the whole of the Middle East gathered against Israel and they sent them packing in the Six Day War, uh, in the Egyptian War, etc., etc. Miracle after miracle. And from then, the desert has literally turned into a fruit basket with a flourishing economy. I've seen it with my own eyes, carved out in the desert, in a country where there shouldn't be any water, in a land where nothing should be growing. They are exporting this robust, robust economy from zero to hero. Friends, this is only God. This is only a fulfillment of Ezekiel 36 and 37. This is a clear fulfillment, a partial fulfillment of the valley of dry bones. Nearly 3,000 years from that time of the united Israel until finally they got their country back again. God's going to do it for the glory of his name. However, I said partial fulfillment. Because even with their physical homeland restored, the Israelites as a whole, and obviously the people of the earth, mostly have no life. The bones have been joined together. The tendons have pulled the bones in the right places and the muscles are in place and the skin has followed, has covered them. And they look like people, but there's no life. This is the condition of all mankind, isn't it? Quite simply, dead men walking. Ephesians chapter 2 says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, that's all we are. You can have as many good works as you can possibly hope to imagine. You could make Mother Teresa blush with the type of good works that you do. But apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, the blessing from Abraham, we have nothing. We are dead men walking. 
As for you, you were dead in your sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the rule of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Everyone, including Israel, needs a miracle in order to know that breath of life. And until we have the breath of God entering into us, making us a new creation, we are nothing but dead men walking. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. So are you a new creation? Not asking if you're perfect. I'm asking, are you new? Are you being made new? See, when that moment happens, in God's eyes, I've been made perfect in Christ. I am his very own righteousness because of Christ. Oh, obviously, there are a few lumps to iron out in between now and glorification. But Philippians 1 says, being confident of this, that who you began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. And I believe that with all my heart. So this valley of dry bones speaks to all of us today. But back to Ezekiel's prophecy. Israel's in her land again, but she's yet to recognize the Savior. But I'm telling you this morning, listen to me. The day will come when God by his spirit opens the eyes of Israel to see their Jewish Jesus, their their Messiah, their, their one who is, who was to come that they didn't recognize when he came. They will recognize him for who he really is. The apostle Paul writes in Romans 11, I don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers, so you may not become conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. That's the moment that God breathes that that life of breath into the nation of Israel. When he allows the scales to come off her eyes, when they suddenly realize this is the one that they pierced. Verse 26, and so all Israel will be saved as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. This day hasn't come yet, but it will come. I believe it will come. So we've got seven minutes left and I haven't started my lessons. Maybe my dream was true. (laughs) Just two thoughts this morning. God fulfills what he sets out to do. This is not often in our time frame, very often not in our ways, not by our prescriptive methods. I mean, I've heard some really far-fetched, weird, and wacky theories on prophecy, and, and this one particularly, what God supposedly will or won't do or supposed to do. But let us never lose sight of the fact that God is God. He has his own time frame, which is usually vastly different from our own, and definitely his own way of doing things. Even the church, early church fathers, as I mentioned, focused on the resurrection part of this because they couldn't see Israel coming together. It was too distant. It was too vague. <laughs> Since Jesus left, people have been expecting, for example, his imminent return. I mean, he said he's coming soon, just like we expect him today. But I want to tell you something. It might be another thousand years might be another three minutes the point is the kingdom is within us now and our role is to seek first that kingdom and his righteousness we serve a king of his kingdom whether we're on earth doing that or whether we've gone on to glory or whether we are here when he comes back to fetch us it's the same king and it's the same kingdom And only those who have his breath of life in them will get to see that kingdom. So let's not grow weary. 
Let's not change focus. Let's not become lazy. We've given our lives to him now. We live for him now. In good or in bad, in plenty or in want, in easy or difficult, and yes, even in sickness and in health. We will live for him. 2 Peter 3 says, Do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years. It's only been three days since Israel lost their nation. It's only been two days since Ezekiel prophesied. (laughs) I mean, what are you panicking about? A day with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. The Lord's not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. The earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promises, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. Friends, I want to say, God fulfills what he sets out to do. Don't don't grow weary in doing good. Don't give up in believing or doing whatever you're doing. Don't think it's never going to come to an end. Maybe it'll take another day (laughs) or thousand years. (laughs) It doesn't matter. God will do what God has said he's going to do. And the second little lesson this morning for us to encourage us is that dry bones doesn't mean it's over. Doesn't matter how dry our bones have become. God can restore all things. It doesn't matter how much we've messed up. It doesn't matter how much we have fallen into sin. It doesn't matter how dilapidated or decrepit or skeletal our bodies look, our spirits look. It doesn't mean it's over. God just has to breathe. It's just a little puff and life is ours. 1 John 1 says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. My dear children, chapter 2 says, I write this to you so you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the propitiation, the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world, for those who will recognize him. So maybe it's a family member you're worried about. Maybe it's a wayward child. Maybe it's a stubborn, hardened parent, a friend, somebody you think would never go near God. Just keep praying. He doesn't want anyone to perish. He doesn't want anyone to perish. You keep praying. You keep trusting. All it takes is a puff. (laughs) I mean, it's just the breath of God. You just keep, you just keep trusting. Hebrews 10 says, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place, that's why we pray. By the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, opened up through the curtain that is his body. In other words, we don't have to bring, we don't have to sacrifice animals. We don't have to pay him. We don't have to try and do good things to get him to listen to us. Jesus has opened that curtain for us. We have access and therefore... It says in verse 22, let us draw near to God. So that's my encouragement to you this morning. Draw near to him. 
we are able to draw near to him. He has raised the skeleton up. He has given the skeleton the breath of his life. We're going to see it one day in Israel in its entirety. We're going to see it one day when the elements are destroyed by fire and a new heaven, the new earth are created, and we are part of that, the, full, the complete fulfillment of Ezekiel 37. But in the meantime, let us draw near to God and continue to trust him. I summarize. If God can raise up a valley of dry bones, and if he can bring together a nation in exile so often for 3,000 years from the one end to the other end, he will yet raise up the people of Israel. They will yet see and identify their true Messiah. And he can raise us both spiritually and physically. Amen.